Hello, I'm Laura Furiosi, divorce mother of three, and I'm here with my mother, Lynette Galvin, with 35 years' experience in family law. You're listening to the Divorce Course Podcast. Through our candid discussions, we hope to help you through your divorce or de facto separation. We will be answering the most commonly asked questions and covering the stages and steps that you will face on your way to freedom. Whether you're in court or not, this is the one single simplest thing you can do to help your case. Welcome, Mum. Hello, Laura. Hello, everyone. I don't know about about simplest, but still, it's it's a very good thing to do. It's only hard if you don't do it as you come as you go along. But we'll talk about that. And I think. I think that's an important point mm. uh, that you've already made, and we haven't even started talking about <laughs> it yet. But yes, if you if you don't do this, it is hard. But if you do it as you go along, it can make everything a lot simpler Perfect. in the future. So, starting off with Mum, we're basically talking about a chronology, mm. and we have touched on it before uh, when we're saying going to see a lawyer and things like that. But why do we need a chronology? So, we're going to cover the why, we're going to cover what you need it for, we're going to cover who needs it, and we're also going to cover how you should create it and then tips to make it work for okay. you. And even though it sounds really simple oh a chronology like a timeline big whoop but can you just give me a crux of why it is so important and the why you think as a lawyer of 35 years experience in family law why is it so important it's desperately important it's a timeline of your life I guess together um, and the relevant um, dates and things that have happened to you now if you put it down in a in a timeline It's a very simple thing to communicate a complicated history to another person. So it's it's vitally important that you do it. Otherwise, you are going to be repeating yourself over and over again in documents and with lawyers. And um, it's simple, Rose, because if you do it as you go, like, uh, you know, start it gently. We're going to give them some guidelines, people guidelines on how to get started. But then as other events happen, you just add it to your chronology and build the document up as you go. Um, if I have a client come and see me and they've got a timeline or chronology, I instantly have a grasp of what's relevant. If I don't have that document when they come in, um, then I'm going to have to say, well, when were you married? When were you born? When were you married? When were the kids born? When did you buy the house? I, so it's it's and and I it really isn't um, good value for the client to pay a lawyer just to do that sort of work. So and everyone, you guys are smart. You know how to do a document and save it, um, mm. and it becomes a living document because you add to it as it goes along. Yeah, and we're going to talk about how to mm. do that and your tips. But I guess it also, like you've just said, so you're not constantly repeating mm. yourself. If any of our listeners are going through domestic violence, there's one thing that they've noticed in the review recently is that uh, the uh, survivors are constantly having to repeat yes. the story or the information. And, and maybe in your position, something's happened and you're not in the right frame of mind to explain what's going on. Or, uh, you know, the police may say what's happening in court or when did this mm. last happen? So if you do have a chronology, even for domestic violence, yes. that you can just email or print out and say, I've explained this to a million people. Can you just please read it? And with, with, with court for family law, like mum said, mm. you can go turn up to the lawyer and say, here you go, this is where we're at currently. Yes. And mum, you also said that when you did your bar course mm. becoming a barrister, yeah. they talked about it, the importance of a chronology. Yeah. So when you're a barrister, you don't know the clients. Uh, you get a brief, a file from a solicitor and you sit down with a cup of coffee. I did and look at it, and it's probably about like 20 centimetres thick. Um, So the first thing you do, if your solicitor hasn't already done it for you, or in our lovely listener's case, the clients will have already done it for the solicitor who passed it to the barrister, is create a chronology to give some sense and structure to what has been happening and putting things in place. So I think, um, like, it's needed if you're going to um, an interim hearing, a final hearing, You need it for mediation. It just keeps cropping up all through the case. So good lawyers Mm. um, often will start doing a chronology from the very first time they see the client and add to it as it goes along because you'll be cutting and pasting or adding it to many documents as you go through. And it just, 
uh, it yes. saves a lot of time. Am I running ahead? We're going to cover those. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we're going to cover Sorry. those specific <laughs> documents that are required mm. uh, for that. Actually, the court documents require a chronology. But even before that, maybe a lot of our listeners, as you found with your mm. clients, mum, they they don't come and see a lawyer f- until things get That's tricky. Right. And so maybe things have been trundling along. So you've lived in the house, they moved out, you've been paying the mortgage, or someone did a, an appraisal for property. If you had a chronology that you just updated every now and then of who's done what or what's happening, uh, when you go see the lawyer, you're not going to be having the lawyer say, I need you to go back and find this date and this date and this, when did this happen? And can you find out exactly? Because, mum, that really can affect a case, can't it? It can. And also, um, because we're going through such awful times, it's not uncommon for people to block out things and completely forget mm. to put them into a chronology. Um, so that's another reason to do it as you go along. Yeah. Because mm. let's face it, like if you are just recently mm. separated, um, you might not think about everything in, in the normal way that normal people are thinking because you're in a crisis mm. state or you're stressed and you might go back to the lawyer in thir- like halfway through the year and go, oh, wait, I don't even remember who did yeah. what. So, and, and same with domestic violence um, it's and, and coercive control in particular, if you're going through that situation, it's really hard for some people to remember things. Yep. Um, and so write it down and, and that can help you. Mm. So it's all about memory and saving money. How does it, if, if you've created your own chronology, mum, how does that save you money? Well, if, if, a, if you go to your lawyer with a chronology already prepared um, and you email it to them in Word, they can cut and paste that into documents as and when needed. They can use it to structure your affidavit efficiently and there's no gaps in the story. You know, they can pick the bits out that they need. Um, I think that uh, really writing a... Um, a chronology or a timeline, if you can't type it somewhere or put it on your phone, just think of it as journaling and just write it somewhere. I think it can be also therapeutic, but it just puts it down. Um, But mainly, yes, for the lawyer, they'll get the gist of your situation very quickly so then they can move on to giving you the advice rather than taking the history of the case. Similarly, which could take an that's hour. That's right. Or, you know, and if you volunteer yeah. every time, if you've got a lawyer, every time there's a stage like we're going to mediation, or we're going to try, volunteer to do the chronology. You can update it, give it to them. They'll take out the bits they don't need. Um, and it just saves you time and money because for a lawyer, it's quite laborious mm-hmm. to do over and over again. I think, yeah. And I guess for those who are, those who are mm. listening who don't have lawyers, it it's is imperative. also beneficial mm. because we're just going to now list all the documents if you're self-repping or if your lawyer's going to mm-hmm. create them for you, that it actually asks for the chronology. Yep. So, Mum, can you talk us through what documents so, ask for chronology? So the, the case outline um, documents for an interim hearing and a final hearing need a chronology. Uh, You need uh, one for the case information for mediation. Um, There's also a document called case information (laughs) that has a chronology. And although if you look at these documents, the space for chronology is quite small, like it's, um, you know, it's only about eight or nine lines. In reality, by the time you finish writing it, um, those that could be a page or two of, of significant events because it could be a long marriage or it could be a long time since you separated or, you know, this, and there's a lot of relevant factors. Why does it? Why does the court need a chronology? I understand why the lawyer mm. needs a chronology so they can understand your case. Mm. Why does the court need Same it? thing, same thing. So... Uh, the, the judges have a couple of hundred cases each and um, they don't know what's been happening between the times that you go to court. And so it's a, a way, before they were in, before they were mandated, you know, before you had to do them, it was a really good way to get brownie points with the judge if you turned up with a nice little chronology and a case outline and that helped the judge just understand the case. Uh, very quickly it was of assistance to the court. But the other thing with the case out, uh, chronology, if you don't do yours properly, the other side will do one and they may end up controlling the narrative and leaving out the things that are important to you. So you do have to both do them. Uh-huh. But if you stumble and don't do yours, 
um, bits can be left out. You also mentioned uh, when we were discussing this mm. previously uh, that you, you can use your chronology for an affidavit. Yes. So I'm guessing you don't put it in your affidavit, but how do you use a chronology mm. for your affidavit? Um, sometimes you can put a chronology in an affidavit if, if it's an incident or, you know, where you might want to put dates and times where people said this and said that. But yes, with an affidavit, it's important that your affidavit flows and that it's chronologically, makes sense chronologically. Uh, so in, we talked in the uh, previous podcasts about the headings that you need in affidavits, depending on what you're proving. But your facts will come from the events that have happened and you'll have those dates in your chronology. You won't have to look them up. You'll, that way, every document you file will have the accurate date. Because I do have clients who you say, well, when did that happen? Oh, I don't know. It was around the time of the finals of footy or it was you know, summer because we're at the beach, but you you just don't remember. So you will have those at your fingertips. So will your lawyer. Um, and that just makes for a very concise and accurate document. And if any clever barrister goes looking par- at your past um, affidavits at a trial, it will all make sense. It'll all still be the same. So, so you need your chronology for your lawyer. You need a chronology, perhaps, if you are dealing in the domestic violence uh, yes. space and you're seeing all the different services, you can just give it to them and say, here, yeah. so I don't have to talk about it every five yeah. seconds. So that would be helpful for you. You also need it for the chronology that you need to file before mediation. Well, not file, but uh, give, give to, to the, the mediator. mediator. You also need it for uh, first court appearances and for trial. And the barrister needs one, yep. You talked about this creating a narrative. Hmm. How does a chronology create a narrative? You wouldn't think it would, would you? You'd think that the facts are the facts and the dates are the dates. Um, But Hmm. you do do put a little bit of detail in. So you you put the, the date and the event and then you can put a little bit of detail in. So, for example, if if there was someone bought a boat on a particular day, say it's a property one, and you can put the date we bought the boat, and uh, or you can say um, my partner bought the boat without talking to me, and put that date in. Or your partner might go, uh, we 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 invested in a boat, or just bought a boat. So you know you can t- start to list things that are the crux of the case, I guess. If your case was that your partner did things and wasted money without talking to you, then you would add those words into that event and make sure every one of those events is relevant. If you're doing a children's matter, you wouldn't put those ones, that's not relevant. So you'd put the things in for the kids. And and there's always a little bit of a spin that can be put on the, the, um, the wording of it, um, always, because it just depends on your point of view. Uh, he says she didn't send the kids. She said he didn't want the kids, you know. So, but whatever it is, there's a date, the children didn't go, and then the because might be different in each of your chronologies. Um, and the judge gets to read both of those and has a sense of your case. Okay, so what kind of things can you include in a chronology? So you've got the headings, date. Event. Event. Details. Yes. Notes. Yep. Details. What kind of things? Is it just things that have happened or can it be letters or emails? Well, or see, texts? they've happened. Like what kind of they've thing? happened too. So it's events. Yeah. Um, I would, when when you want to start with one, the, the easiest way to do it is put the date of birth of the eldest of you, you or your partner, and you say, uh, and such and such, such and such was born, and then your date of birth was born. They're usually the first two things. Uh, then you might have a... Well, that's a really long chronology if you're starting from your birth. Well, they're <laughs> or critical you, is dates. Is it just to say this is yeah, your age? critical okay, dates. Yeah. Okay, but you, you're not filling in no, your no, childhood. No, it, because you no. skip okay, straight okay. from those things to the date of cohabitation. <laughs> so it's right. just setting okay, the, the groundwork. So Because... Every lawyer needs to know for property and probably children too how old these people are, what's the age difference, how yeah. much work life have they got ahead of them and, you know, all of those things. Okay, so we go date of birth, okay. then skip straight to date of living together, which might be the same as the date of marriage. You might have a date of marriage or you might not have a date of marriage. So though cohabitation, then date of marriage. Then generally it's like you might have bought a house or... Uh, you might have moved to Sydney or, you know, um, then there'd be births of the children, child one's birth, child two birth. You might find it easier to put the the dates of birth and the names of the kids 
um, as the next three things and then just put information between the children, you know, uh, because you'll remember, mm. oh, that's right, we bought that house in Wavell Heights after Billy was born, so you'll be able to put that in. And so gradually just mm. pack it out. The court's interested in this. So we go back to my polythene pipe theory uh, for anyone who hasn't doesn't remember that. So the court has decided, and I think what else are they going to do, that things that happen during a marriage between you both financially are never going to be um, clear and never going to be agreed upon, and they don't care what happens. So the court's focus is before what you had at the beginning. So what goes into that pipe? What wires go in? Did you have a car? Did you have a credit card? Did you have a job? You know, so you'd put those dates that you, if you got a job or if you, you know, that sort of matters. What happened during the marriage is a bit irrelevant because court can't unravel it. They just then look at what you've got since, how it's going, who's taken what so far and how your circumstances are. You mean after, after you've you've separated. separated. They look at yeah. what happens after so they look separation. At when you got together, after you separated. And the only thing that they're interested in in the interim usually is any outside influences, injections of cash and stuff. So, so your when even though the buying the house probably happened during happened during the marriage, um, it's it's just bought the house. You wouldn't need to put too much information there. So we kind mm-hmm. of condense that then. So the court's looking at um, things like if it's children looking at who raised the children, who who work full-time, if it's property, who studied, uh, when they got the qualifications, which jobs they've had, just kind of a financial history. And then they look at, the court would look at then a legal history. So if there's been any court cases, uh, if someone started for mediation. So it's, it's not as detailed as you think, um, except if you start then to find a case. If your case is about who said what about something, right, the business, then you would put in detail the letters that have gone to and fro about, you know, whether it's going to be bankruptcy or not. But if you, that's not an issue, just don't don't mention that um, and just stick to stuff right, that's so relevant. Let's think of it. Let's think of a, a, a simple example that most people might have to go through. Sorry to interrupt this podcast, but we have some valuable information that might just help you out. If you're separated or about to be and ready to get everything finalised and sorted, but you don't know what to do next, or you're looking for a way to do your own divorce and settlement without spending thousands of dollars on lawyers, or you're looking to make property and parenting agreements and finalise your divorce papers with your ex-partner while keeping in control and in the know of each step and stage that needs to be done in the legal process, then you already know what you need to do, and that is to sign up to our DIY Divorce Blueprint. Empower, educate and equip yourself with the legal know-how and tools you need to get divorced and finally settle. Work through this course at your own pace without feeling confused, lost, scared and overwhelmed with the family law legal jargon and processes. We invite you to the DIY Divorce Blueprint, lovingly created by mum with over 40 video lessons, PDF templates, swipe files and letter template guides. We're there for you. Enroll now. Go to www.thedivorcecourse.com.au and find out more. Let's think of a a, a simple example that most people might have to go through if they own Mm -hmm. a house together and they have to sort out who's Mm -hmm. going to get it. After separation, uh, maybe they could put in the chronology, our valuer came to the house. Or they could say date of separation and then who left for house and then um, where did the other person go? you know, and then the mm-hmm. date of the value mm-hmm. of the ha- valuation of the house and then if there was a contract that date. What about with children? What about with children? What kind of things after separation are you supposed to be putting in the it's chronology? Not, it's tricky. It depends. Are you talking, so if you're talking about someone's health, maybe you might list the date they were diagnosed with asthma or something and, and what how many hospitalisations they've had and all of those. If the dispute is about the amount of time the children spend, you then would probably put a history of how what from from this date to this date, little Billy spent um, every second weekend and half school holidays with the father or with the mother, and then on this date um, he commenced spending extra time. That sort of thing. So the court's got a history. So if you're 
Although I would like our um, listeners to do chronologies for every aspect, children, property and domestic violence, it might be a good idea to have them in separate lists. And as things Mm -hmm. become relevant, you might have more entries for a period of time about how the, you know, the important thing that you've gone to court about, depending on what it is you've gone to court about. So that's what you're saying. You're using the chronology to um, support the narrative mm. that you're trying to explain. So, of course, if, you, if you've if you gone through and you're doing property and children at the same time, but the house has been sold and there's no drama with property, uh, everything's going to be fine and you're not fighting over that, it's probably not really important to put too that's much right. detail Just in the about date. the letter from yeah. the bank or the date. Um, so folk, have a think about what are the issues that... The you want the judge or the lawyer to help you with and they're probably more the issues you want to include in your chronologies and and like we've discussed the different types of chronologies you need would probably be different for each stage of you know if you're doing a chronology to see your lawyer they're probably going to want yes, to see everything yes it's kind of the uh, if you're doing soup. it's a soup yeah. you put everything yes. in order this is yeah. <laughs> This is my days in my lives chronology. But if you're doing mediation but you're only mediating about the children, you're probably not going to include hardly any detail about the property. property. It might be relevant if you're still living in the house um, and the date of separation, of course, is relevant. But, no, you'd be focusing then on the children and their needs and if there's been a family report and how they're going at school. And so if you're going to trial, uh, your chronology probably should be about the issues that are not agreed on yep. yet. So if it's, That's I don't know, choosing the child's school or if it's... Property, it um, might be a percentage. Wanting to move yep. somewhere else or it, property. So the chronology needs to support that. Mum, so what are some tips to make the chronologies work for you? Put you on the spot there. <laughs> so people are listening. Mm-hmm. Uh, you to know, make it work because for you. Because we, we yeah. just... Everybody needs to do it, whether you're the applicant or the respondent, whether you're in court or not. It's always a good yep. idea to do it because you do need to do it for mediation. You do. So what are some tips okay. to make it work for you? So my, for the listeners. For the listeners, yeah. The, my number one tip is to um, don't put too much information in, only a couple of words because in your details of the event because it's important that it's date, 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 date that the court or the lawyer can run their eyes down and get a handle on it. If you put half a page of explanation for one date, then there's it doesn't flow and, and no one's going to read it. That's for your affidavit. So you just put that little twist if you need to, that little emphasis, but don't make it too convoluted that way. And then that way you can present um, a lawyer or presumably a judge um, in those hearings with a couple of pages of dates and they can just quickly scan through and get the gist of of it without getting annoyed with you. Um, But also for people who are doing them, um, my best tip, I think, is to start early and get it when there is probably no more information other than dates of birth, times you live together, when you're separated and by the house. Um, If that's you know, that that might be all you need at the early stages before you go to see a lawyer. But things, something will flare up. That's why you go to see a lawyer. You know, you might even have a date. I wrote and asked for him to come to mediation. He wouldn't, or I asked him about um, selling the house and he didn't agree. So if that's your problem, then just put those dates in. Sometimes yeah. with emails, things fly thick and fast And um, a tip that always really stayed with me from the bar practice course um, when I was a barrister is to, if you've got a number of things happen on one day, put them in time order because they've always got a time stamp. So something might have come in at 10.20, you sent back at 10.40, and and that puts it in a better, um, just puts it in perspective, perspective for the court other than just putting them all in as just one date without putting the date time stamp on it. But most things you don't need to worry about, what time you started living yes. together <laughs> or what time the baby was born. Now, we, I believe we'll have some people who are super studious and they will create their little spreadsheet and they'll fill it in every day. Then we'll have some people who do not want to have a bar mm-hmm. of it and you'll have some people who just do not want to do it. They do not want a bar hmm. of it. And I guess you need to think about what kind of personality you have um, and it can be very hard to just write one sentence in your details when you are furious or you are bawling your eyes out or you're really feeling just despondent. So what what you what I would recommend people do as well is 
have a, a second yes. page or a journal to just get that out, write it down, write the date and just write all your the verbal detail. diarrhea yep. and all your sadness <laughs> and everything that you can get out, which may be useful anyway when you go back and you give your chronology to your lawyer or you give the chronology to police or give it to the judge. And then they say, well, I want some more information. Or when you're writing your affidavit, yes. you might not remember. So if you've got that journal, you can go back and have a look. But it's really important uh, to you know, be brief, but also set yourself that that routine. Maybe you do it once a week. If everything's going thick and fast and there's letters coming left, right and center, do it every day. Um, But also, mum, I don't know if people are technologically uh, challenged or not, but if you can, because what might happen is you might send your chronology to your lawyer and then they're going to say, great, we're going to do an affidavit. Can you please send me the letter that you've mentioned here, the letter you've mentioned here and the letter mentioned here? You're then going to have to go back into your emails and search through, find which one it is. So maybe if it is an important letter enough to be in the chronology, download it, save it, mm-hmm. or even hyperlink, hyperlink it, it is fine. in your chronology yeah. if you can figure out how to do that. But just have that in a folder as well so that you're not looking for it later, including photos, like if you're mm-hmm. in domestic violence, if there's a photo that you've referred to in your chronology after an incident, or a video, make sure you've downloaded photo. it and saved yep, it in that's a folder. Perfect. Or a photo yeah. of you on holidays yeah. when he says you weren't together or a photo of, mm-hmm. of you at mm-hmm. Christmas when he said the relationship was over. Sometimes people yes. attach a page. So if there's a, like, there's not a lot to say about your date of birth or his date of birth or, you know, cohabitation. But there might... I'm sure you've got a lot to say about my date of birth, Mum. <laughs> it was a glorious day. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, yes. but but you you've if you've got a lot and there's a lot of meat rather than upset that flow that I'm talking about where where a person can just run their eyes down and get a feeling for it put a little note that says see attached number 1 or see attached number 2 and you can if you don't want to do hyperlinks and if you don't want to um um I guess physically like attach them as PDFs at least print them out and have them connected to it um, and then scan it as one mm. document, it'll be invaluable because some of those things, when you're doing an affidavit, you might want to prove that that letter came and there it'll be. Mm. So you've really enhanced your mm. chronology. They won't send hyperlinks to the judge, but the no. the um, template we're going to send you gives you room for the details and you can cut that off like anyone with, you know can delete that when they just want to insert this into a document. So it becomes kind of your statement as well. But try and just have it all because the court is a little bit old and yes. days. Um, Mum, you had a question recently from uh, one of our listeners about she had a video mm. uh, and the lawyer said we can't mm. use videos in court and you recommended to her to a, do a what? A transcript. So you, you, you get – there's two ways of doing a transcript. One is you type out word for word what's said but no one's going to necessarily believe that because you might have added a word or removed a word that didn't make you look good. Um, or you can have mm. the, the um, your lawyer's secretary's translate it or transcript. But any in any event, if you type out word for word what was said, like uh, Martha, so you're going out again, Peter. <laughs> well, yes, I am. What what of it? That sort of thing. Um, and then you say mm. in your affidavit, you attach it to an affidavit and say we had this conversation on this day, um, and uh, attached is a transcript of that combination, a true and conversation a true correct transcript of that conversation and I have the video or I have the audio available for the court if needed and I will I always give the associate a bit of a heads up so say we were going to court tomorrow or the next day I'd send a quick email to the associate just letting you know Mr Associate or Madam Associate uh, I will want to play an audio or I will want to play video during the hearing and they have it set up then for the court and so at some point um, in the proceedings, the, the judge might go, well, let me hear this. Let me play it. And and you can. So you've teed it up. Mm. Yeah, it's mm. it's awkward okay. and it does hold up judges, but it, sometimes it's the very best way to get it across. You know, if the words, um, the words might be enough, but the, so the other side can check for themselves, you'll have given them the copy. So you have given them the video or the audio so they can listen to it and prove that it's correct, you know. Yeah, so you can get it in. So pop it in your chronology. If there's something happened, you can put in the details. You can write 
uh, video available. Yes. And transcript um, available. Or video number yeah, blah, and transcript and available transcript or transcript available attached. In your chronology. Yep. That's right. Depends who yes. you're tailoring okay. your document to. All right. So we need a chronology to help with costs, yes. to help with our memory, yes. to help with writing affidavits, yep. to help proving coercive control, yep. to help having to repeat yourself to different domestic violence services. You need a chronology for court affidavits, filing chronologies for mediation. You need it for court appearances. You need it for your case outline for trial and obviously meeting your lawyers and you need it whether you're a, the respondent or the applicant. So whether you're not, and or if you're not in court yet, because it's mediation as well. So it's everybody has to have a chronology at some point, and you can create it as simply as putting a document in Excel or in Word or whatever you use with the headings, the date, the event, yep. and the details. Yep. And and you know, it, uh, as you've said, Mum, it, depending on whether it's kids, hmm. property, or DV. You know, you can have three different ones, but also remembering it, there's no harm in putting in That's too many right. dates, That's I guess, right. as long as you, you can tailor it to each section of what part of your you're, divorce you're, you're facing with, at that That's moment. right. And your lawyer will, yeah. if you send it to the lawyer, it's easy for them to cull and it should save you a lot of money. Um, and while they're doing it, they're getting a better handle on your case, by the way. So they're reading it and understanding. Yes, because if you if they're creating a chronology for you for your mediation, they're going to go backwards and forwards to the documents, sending you yep. an email which costs you fifty dollars. Can you send me this date when you did this? Can you send me and this and then you document? send it back? You know, and, and that, that could costs fifty dollars. Yeah, yep. exactly. So it's really about keeping your costs down and keeping your memory in check. And mm. and I know I called it simple, and Mum, you're saying it's not simple, and I get that. But if you are doing this consistently, yes. weekly or daily, if things are crazy, then you are going to be giving yourself five pats on the back and going, thank yeah. goodness I did that at the oh. time. Because you might not think you might not think you're going to go to court, you might not think you're going to go to mediation, but you never no, know. And right. if you forget this stuff, it's really hard to go back and dig through your emails and your phone and yes. your, all these things that you need to try and remember. It, it can be a nightmare. Well, also, so you're saving yourself trouble. Yes, and you're only if you have a lawyer, you're only your case is only as good as their statement taking skills are. Um, so you might not think there's so many things in law. We, I hope we're educating people and helping them, but there's so many things that you might think is not important, um, but that are pivotal to a case. And if you've never, if you haven't put it in your chronology, and it takes so the the lawyer then creates a chronology of their own. If you haven't done a chronology, they create it. They'll leave that out. Um, it's too late later on, like closer to trial to go, oh, well, also mum gave me $20,000. Well, it's too late to say that because you should have raised it earlier. So there's great virtue in doing a detailed chronology for property, children and DV, and keeping it up to date and fresh. And there's no harm, absolutely no harm in giving it all to a lawyer who can flick out the bits they don't need. You don't know what diamonds are in there. Mm. That's true. And a lawyer doesn't know what they don't That's know. Right. And you don't what know they... what you don't know when it comes to yep. the legal, you know, and you know, hopefully we're helping you like mum said, but you might not know what's mm. important, what's not. So it's really important to keep that in mind, put it all in there and the lawyers can sift it out if they yep. need to. Now, finally, mum, I have one more question before we go. And we also need to uh, give oh, an lovely. award, uh, not an award, a free 30 oh, minute phone call. Oh, good. Uh, to one of our lovely oh, reviewers. Lovely. Um, but lastly, Mum, how what, what happens if you go to mediation or if you go to court and your ex's chronology is just crazy compared to your chronology? Uh, what, what do you mean by then? crazy? Completely different. Oh, okay. Uh, or wrong. Oh, wrong. Or conflicting. Yes. Well, I think the court will, um, that's going to be an interesting point. But generally the person with the most cohesive chronology they carry the day, really, because the judge is naturally going to be drawn to the one that makes sense, the one that's all over the place and, and inconsistent. Um, so in your case, when you write a date, everyone, and then you have an event, generally you need to know it somewhere, even if you hyperlink it like Laura said or keep it in a folder, you have to have the proof if you, if you can, if there is such a thing. This happened and here's the proof. Um, on this date... This happened, 
And here's the proof. So that in your mind, you're ready. You've got all that evidence. We were talking about hyperlinking it. We were talking about um, sending it or even printing it so the lawyer's got it. Um, and that will carry the much more weight than, like, obviously, if you're telling the truth and they're telling a lie and you've got your document to prove it, they don't have anything to prove it. And so you will end up um, being the chronology that the court relies on um, and that... Uh, in the end is the one that um, your case then is the one that's more likely to succeed. So it's a really important thing to have right, really important. Mm. And I guess you always talk about this narrative and, and making sure that that they're not controlling the narrative, the other side. So in, um, for example, in an affidavit you talked about the other day in the last two episodes ago, how if they're writing all about your, um, I don't know, your health or all about something and they're not mentioning any of the issues that you want to mention and you spend your whole affidavit responding to their affidavit, that, that's them controlling that's winning. the yep, narrative. They win. yep. Is that the same with the chronology? I think so. If, yeah. if you... I, th- I think so. You've got to sp- you speak your truth. And 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 don't be um, swept up with, um, like, if they've put, say, the date they bought, I don't, I'm talking about a boat all the time, the day they bought the new ute and you know it wasn't that date, don't be misled into arguing that point in your chronology if it's not really relevant. Um, keep to the things that really are relevant. That might have been the day after he took 50000 out of the account or he or something like that. So you you just tell your story because it, it, court is a story. You're telling your story. You're asking the judge to make certain findings based on your story that will give you the outcome you want. And one one other mm-hmm. thing, Laura, I know we're nearly out of time. Sometimes doing a chronology and then finding the evidence that goes with the chronology will sometimes show you that your memory was faulty and you had it wrong. Mm. You, you know that saying, I could have sworn it was in March, but apparently it was in July because here, here's the photo, or here's the tickets from the movie. So that allows you then to correct your chronology so that you don't have that embarrassing situation where the other side goes, that's not right, look, here's the, here's the th- mm. ticket. So we often forget things, of course. But um, when you start doing your chronology, I assume you'll be already separated. So some of the things that happened during the marriage may be um, a bit far off for you to remember. I wouldn't know what I was doing in 2017. Um, I'd have to look mm. on Facebook. But, <laughs> but you know. Well, that's a good way to figure it is, out your it's chronology. Great. And Facebook. to call out the lies. But, yes, don't use your chronology to call out the lies unless it's really crucial to your case. Yeah. All right. Well, hopefully our listeners out there have taken some of this on board. And if you haven't got a chronology started yet, get cracking. Even if between the next time you see your lawyer, it can save you money if you don't keep emailing your lawyer every five minutes and you just say, here's a chronology of everything that's happened since last time. Uh, Yes. And so we're going to be providing a chronology template that will be available Um, So you can click on that and purchase that to to help you if you're interested. But more importantly as well, we have been um, getting some wonderful reviews that really make us cry for the podcast on the Apple Podcast Review. If you have not had a chance to do us a review but you really enjoy our podcast and we have helped you, if you do a review, it will help get our podcast out to more people because Apple Mm. pushes it more, who need it. Um, who might not know we exist because we're, there's not many Aussie divorce uh, podcasts out mm. there with this amazing mother <laughs> over here. So if you can do a review, we would really love that. Even if you just do the five stars and don't write any words, but you know, or you know, if if you think we deserve five stars. But today uh, we're drawing for the month um, one of the reviews that we've received, and this is from Mandam twenty four, and. Sh- she or he has written, as I sit here going through one of the toughest times of my life, listening to these podcast episodes helps empower me by feeling like I'm being equipped with some of the most helpful advice. You get it. 
Thanks, inverted commas, mum and Laura, smiley face. So oh, thank you so me, much that for did writing make me that. Cry. <laughs> <laughs> and we really are hoping that the more people hear about this podcast, the more people that we can help. And if you have got any topics that you would like us to discuss or any episodes, email us at the divorce course podcast at gmail.com. And also stay tuned. We have just put up a new webinar that will be happening next month called Who Stays in the House? Mm. And we're discussing your rights in family law with property settlement. So that's going to be a great great. webinar. If you're interested, go to www.thedivorcecourse.com.au and you can click on the register for our free webinars. Thank you, Mum, so much for your time and knowledge. (laughs) And hopefully out there, everyone can go and feel like they've got a little bit of um, help today and hopefully we'll keep your costs down and save your sanity. Thank you, Mum, so much. No worries. Thank you, Laura, for interpreting (laughs) for me. Bye, everyone. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Bye. If you found this podcast helpful, we'd love it if you could rate, review and subscribe. By doing so, you are spreading the word to help someone else just like you. Lynn would like to remind you that this podcast is general advice only and you should always get legal advice in relation to your particular situation. And remember that the Australian laws may have changed since recording 